Yeah, so you remember from MP1 that you spoke to those, so you told the story about like, Jack the Ripper? Uh huh. About the Stern of Cleto Mask. Right. Yeah. I, I, I thought about telling you about uh, at the beginning of the year the genetic test they did and they found a Very DNA nice. suspect, like a said, 23 year old, college partner. Yes, yes. I, heard, I, I was like, I got yeah. to the professor. Yeah, I've heard about, you know, there's, um, I, well, I was, I watching, it was, um, well, the thing with uh, Fishburne uh, that does um, unex, uh, uh, Unexplained Mysteries, Greatest, greatest Mysteries, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and he had a thing on it just, just a couple of weeks ago. Did you watch right. that? And I was like, I have, to, I have to tell you, I'm pretty sure you you knew that's it. Well, you know, um, my wife and I have read lots of books on it, so. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it just there's so many so many good theories out there too, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and of course, any any good Jack the Ripper movie, we always have to watch. Too. Okay, I haven't seen a single movie. Oh, there's Thank one you. from the 1950s called The Lodger. 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 And it's, it's it never says he's Jack the Ripper, but it's it's pretty and he's he's a pathologist. Okay. So and um they always talk about cutting from the sternocleidomastoid to that and it's like anatomy. <laughs> yeah, there you go.
Okay, I think we um, <clears throat> have a lot online today, but that's okay. Um, let's go ahead and get started here. And we are going into female sexual response. As we've already addressed the male sexual response. So it's a very similar process in the female. It is also driven by the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Remember in the male, the uh, parasympathetic nervous system causes the release of acetylcholine and nitric oxide which causes blood vessels to dilate, to enlarge, increasing blood flow. Same thing's gonna happen here in the female. The um, blood flow is gonna increase to the clitoris, to the vagina, uh, to the breasts. Um, the, um, the clitoris will enlarge, the nipples will enlarge, the labia will enlarge uh, and turn, can often turn bright red, so. Uh, so this is all, it's a, um, it is a parasympathetic response to increase the blood flow. Orgasm in the female, just like in the male, is driven by the sympathetic side. So it's the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine in here. So we have both a sympathetic response for orgasm, a parasympathetic response for sexual arousal. So now, um, 
when the blood flow increases, it also stimulates the release of more mucus uh, from the uh, goblet cells that line this whole area. Remember, this is all going to be um, these cells, many of these cells, like lining the, the vagina and the labia, are going to be stratified squamous epithelial with lots of goblet cells. You know, they're not keratinized, they're not waterproof. They're, they want to have this lubricant here. The clitoris is spongy tissue, just like the nipples are. They're spongy tissue. They'll become enlarged uh, as blood flow increases here. So the, the glands that lubricate the vestibule are going to become much more active and secrete lots of mucus. At the point of orgasm is driven by stimulus of the clitoris. It's not by penetration uh, during intercourse. It is a stimulation of the clitoris. And, you know, again, as I said, the glands of the clitoris is extremely sensitive to mechanical stimulation to touch, just like the glands of the penis is. And so as this stimulation continues, it will uh, ultimately result in a, a release of tension, uh, a, uh, which is characterized by the, the orgasm. You'll have a surge of... Um, neurotransmitters, dopamine, and the endorphins are going to have a, have a tremendous sense of, of pleasure and well-being during yeah. orgasm. Uh, uh, when, just like in the male during orgasm, the heart rate goes up, the breathing rate goes up, there's a series of rhythmic muscle contractions, smooth muscle, smooth muscle contractions. In this case, the uterus and the vagina are, are going to have these, these uh, intense contractions for a few, for a few seconds. Now, males cannot have an immediate second orgasm. Uh, they have what's known as a refractory period. So a male has an orgasm, and uh, it may take minutes to hours to days before a second orgasm can occur. So we say this is a refractory period. The male does not respond uh, to an immediate stimulus right after the first orgasm. However, women, females do not have a refractory period. So they can achieve, as they say here, multiple orgasms during, during one experience. Let me make it clinical here. You know, during sex, a woman, a woman can have more than one orgasm because there is no uh, resetting refractory period like males have. Uh, so the, the concept, the idea of having an, a single orgasm in the female is not true. Now, and the other thing that is, is often misunderstood is if a, uh, it, is, it is believed by some people, maybe it's an old wives' tale, I don't know, that if you didn't have an orgasm, you couldn't get pregnant. But orgasm is not necessary for conception. Because remember, conception is a totally different act. Conception involves delivery of the sperm uh, into the vagina, into the uterus, up into the fallopian tube, and maybe there's an egg up there. Didn't matter if there was an orgasm or not. You know, uh, so orgasm is not an, a requirement for conception to take place. So. Okay, so female sexual response, touch and stimulus, um, psychological, you know, emotional stimulus, uh, you know, talking about sex, thinking about sex, uh, like in a male, uh, the, the blood flow increases to all these areas we just talked about. Uh, the, the lining of the vagina gets, gets extremely moist. Uh, the vagina actually enlarges. Uh, the labia open up. Uh, the labia actually spread apart here. Um, the... Um, you have a, a dramatic increase in blood pressure and heart rate, which sort of goes hand in hand, as well as breathing rate. And the nipples become erect because they are also the uh, spongy tissue. So the, the phases, there are several phases here in female sexual response. Phase one, heart rate goes up. This is, this is probably before intercourse uh, occurs. Um, heart rate, respiratory rate, the skin will flush because increased blood flow going, going into the skin. So there's a what's known as a sexual flush that spreads up across the face 
down across the, the, the chest region. Males can experience this too. Um, of course, the nipples harden, the uh, vagina starts to become lubricated, uh, the, the clitoris and the labia start swelling. This is all in phase one. Phase two is right before orgasm. Um, the clitoris becomes so sensitized, it actually draws back within the glands. Uh, the vaginal wall may become very, uh, it's highly lubricated, uh, but it may swell up and become very firm. Uh, it may even turn purple because there's so much blood flow going in there. There may be, um, as I say, spas muscle spasms and vocalizations, meaning, you know, um, you may see that the female may speak or say something or just make funny noises, you know. Um, I was trying to think of that, uh, what was that? Uh, I can't remember the name of it now. Um, anyway, so um, okay, so they're they're these are all normal. Your patient comes in and says, "I make funny noises during sex," and you say, "Or that's fine, that's allowed." You know, it's not against the rules because that's what's going to happen as you're approaching this second phase here uh, of sexual arousal. So. Orgasm, the shortest phase, it just lasts for a few seconds. Um, the muscles become very tense, the, pulse, the heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, the uterus starts contracting. There may be more sounds. There may be more muscle spasms here. Um, it, uh, the tension is dra dramatically released. And of course we have the endorphins being released as well as the um, dopamine uh, so, you know, it, it's, a, it's an intense sense of pleasure. In here. And then the resolution phase, the last phase of it here, everything comes back to normal blood pressure drops, back to normal heart rate drops, the muscles relax. Uh, there is a very strong sense of intimacy in here. Uh, there's a feeling of uh, you want to sleep. Um, and it depends on whether or not there is continued contact before the determined if a woman will have an additional orgasm. So um, they, it, it all can take place here. And if your patient says it, you know, uh, presents and says, well, every time we have sex, I have lots of orgasms. Is that normal? You know, or they come in and might say, I only have one. Is there something wrong with me? You know, both are normal. Those are normal responses, you know. Okay, now, the um, sex drive in the female, her libido is driven by um, one of the androgens. The female libido, just like the male libido, is driven by testosterone, which is produced by the male, is the male androgen. The female's libido, her sex drive, is also driven by her adrenal cortex. And this becomes particularly significant in your postmenopausal female. Because after menopause, the ovaries shut down or have shut down. No more estrogen coming from the ovaries. But the adrenal cortex, the uh, zona uh, reticularis, is still turning out uh, these androgens. And these androgens in males are, you know, males don't have a, uh, a menopause, if you will. But the female will be still turning out these androgens, which are testosterone, which are converted in their body <clears throat> to uh, estrogen. That's going to drive, that's going to increase their libido. And many women, many postmenopausal females will often question why their libido, their sex drive is so high after menopause. But it's, it's a perfectly normal response. The, the, the androgens are now the only source of estrogen that the female has, and they've always been driving the sex drive. And now it's the only ones out, you know, being produced. This is, this is a, the, the, the desire to have sex occurs more frequently, at least for a while during, you know, in postmenopausal females. So, and there's the other question that you may get, is there something wrong with me because I want to have sex more often? And no, 
it's a perfectly normal response driven by their uh, adrenal cortex in here. So, because libido, the desire to have sex, is driven in males by testosterone and in females by the estrogens. So, okay. now, there are considerations for sex after menopause. It, it um, the libido may, you know, the desire to have sex um, is um, usually out of order now, it, 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 out of sequence, because it's usually the libido, the desire to have sex is usually the thing that starts the whole process of, of wanting to, to have intercourse. So, um, however, in your old, in your postmenopausal females, the arousal occurs first. Female will become sexually aroused and then she will desire to have sex. Her libido follows her arousal. So arousal is um, more of a um, mechanical stimulation process, you know, in here more, let's make it a little more clinical, tactile stimulation, how's that, is that better? So, um, so the desire to have uh, sex will occur after the male female becomes sexually aroused. And we, one of the things that occurs here is that since the ovaries are shut down, the, the normal lubrication of the vagina doesn't occur as rapidly. It takes longer for that uh, the vagina to become lubricated. Um, the vagina may atrophy to a little uh, to some extent. And so um, less lubrication makes it a little more painful you know, because it's drier. And so um, it, you have, for the female to uh, want to have sex, she has to become aroused first, and then her libido will kick in and drive the desire. Um, so it's sort of um, backwards in the process. Doesn't mean she doesn't want to have sex, it just means that her desire follows her sexual arousal. You know, Whereas prior to menopause, uh, the libido, the desire, uh, would be would drive the arousal. Here, the arousal it just it's flipped. The arousal drives the desire to to have sex, and that may be what why uh, uh, your your postmenopausal female patients may question: Is there something wrong with me? Because you know now you know I'm I'm you know I, I have these arousals this this arousal issue, you know, and I want to have sex more frequently. Uh, you know, what's wrong? Because she, you know, it's a complete flip from how her body was functioning, you know, prior to menopause. Now, but you know, your postmenopausal female is not alone in this. Would you be surprised to know that the population group that has the highest rate of occurrence of sexually transmitted diseases is the over 50 generation? Older people have more STDs than any other population group because they're having more unprotected sex than any other any other population subgroup in the U.S. So, uh, 80 80 percent of adults. This is an amazing statistic. Between 50 and 90 are sexually active. Think about your grandma. For a second. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. Just thinking it's of the true. fact my poor grandmother couldn't get out of bed. <laughs> she was a veteran. <laughs> Deliveries? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I will tell you, my 83-year-old mother-in-law has a boyfriend, so I'll just let it go at that. So, hmm? oh yeah, yeah. So, okay, let's see. Um, yes, here's a here's a good point. There's lots of retirement homes that have to have STD education classes because one of the biggest areas of sexually transmitted diseases in elder in, in your older patients 
occur in re, uh, assisted living facilities, um, retirement homes, nursing homes, you know, so because, you know, it's um, everybody's living together. So if you have a patient over 60, they are in the group that has the greatest increase in treatment for STDs. Herpes, gonorrhea, syphilis, hepatitis B, trichomoniasis, which is actually you know, not dangerous, but really smelly disease, and chlamydia. Chlamydia went up 23% in three years. And this is in the age range of 60, 50 to 90. If you look at the overall population over 13, which may or may not be uh, low enough to, to, to catch the, the middle school kids. Um, the average population, and I'm not saying that as a, that's not sarcasm about middle school. We'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, the overall population increase is only 11%. The, the whole spike in STDs in the US are being driven by the older Americans. So, okay. So, so what are these diseases? Well, there's, we call them STDs or STIs, sexually transmitted diseases or infections. Um, the old, old name used to be venereal diseases. You go back 50 years and everybody called them venereal diseases. And the, the two that they can, uh, were most focused on uh, were syphilis and gonorrhea. Oh, good point here. Sounds like they aren't using condoms since it's after menopause, they can't have kids and don't realize what condoms can do. And that's a very good point. You have sexually active males and females in close proximity, and um, they're not worried about pregnancy anymore or concerned about pregnancy. And they're forgetting that, you know, there are still STDs that are available. So, um, okay. Now, and that drives right to the point here. We have the highest rate in all developed countries of uh, sexually transmitted diseases ar around the world. Uh, condoms work really well. Now, they're not 100% effective in, in preventing pregnancy and unwanted pregnancy. They're close, but they tear, they leak, they come off. Um, but they are very good in preventing an STD because they're a barrier between <clears throat> either the, in, the infected penis or the infected vagina or both. So because it, you know, it works both ways. And this is since, you know, we've seen a uh, chlamydia is a very common sexually transmitted disease. It's very similar to gonorrhea, only it, 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 the case numbers uh, shoot way up. Uh, it's had a 4.7, you don't need to remember these percentages, it's going up mm -hmm. since 2015. Gonorrhea, which we thought was gone because it was that's been around for forever, um, it's, it's gone up by 18%. And even syphilis has gone up about 18%. You know, and gonorrhea and syphilis for years were the only STDs anybody ever worried about. Yeah. Um, if, if, um, if a person grew up in the 50s, there are only three things they worried about when uh, was, you know, the risk of pregnancy or uh, catching, you know, acquiring one of, you know, gonorrhea or syphilis. None of these other diseases had, you know, they were probably in the background, but they hadn't had not spread or had a dramatic increase. So, chlamydia is still the most common bacterial infection in the U.S. So this is important. Chlamydia and gonorrhea and syphilis are all bacterial, which means they can be treated with antibiotics and treated very effectively. The viral um, diseases, you have to use antiviral drugs and, and, and antiviral medications. There are really no viral diseases that have been truly cured ever. You know, there are treatments, and I saw on the news the other day that somebody had been cured of HIV 
you know, which is a, a viral, uh, you know, AIDS caused by the HIV virus, uh, which is why they call it the human immunodeficiency virus, I guess. Um, let's just be a little redundant here. But it was only the second time that this person was considered cured. Many people uh, take the antiviral drugs and go into remission, but that doesn't mean that they're, that they're cured. Anyway, so chlamydia, number one um, bacterial STD in the US. It's caused by bacteria, chlamydia, uh, trachomatis, or whatever we call it. Um, the downside of all this, yes, we can treat it with antibiotics, but if it's untreated, this is what called, remember all those pictures I showed you the other day of the um, um, ovaries and the uh, fallopian tubes overgrown with scar tissue? Well, that from uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, chlamydia causes that because the bacteria live in, get into the, the fallopian tubes, grow in there, create scar tissue, and they spread out and they can overgrow the ovaries. They can block the fallopian tubes. They can block the urethra uh, in the male. And so uh, they can cause infertility simply because you can't get the sperm to the egg. The egg can't get into the fallopian tube or it can't get out of the ovary. I mean, it's released from the ovary, but it can't get anywhere. Or there's so much scar tissue inside the urethra that sperm have a, uh, bless you, have a great difficulty. In, bless you. So uh, getting uh, through the urethra or the scar tissue in the vagina or the uterus can still block the sperm. So now, symptoms. Discharges from the penis, from the urethra. The discharges, unfortunately, are clear. Um, so it's, it's hard to, to notice these discharges. They don't smell funny. Uh, you would see pain during intercourse in here. Pain during, um, uh, and for a male, pain in the, te in the testes. Uh, pain in the vaginal area. Unexplained pain in here. Uh, many cases, there are no symptoms. So now you're fighting a bacterial infection of the reproductive tract that you don't even know you've got it. And of course, you're, you're, you can spread the disease, but if it's gonna grow in your body, it can cause uh, infertility by blocking the urethra, uh, blocking the vas deferens, blocking the fallopian tubes, growing around the ovaries, making it impossible for um, conception to occur. Um, you can even uh, affect newborns because if the bacteria is growing in the vagina, as the baby passes through the birth canal, it can affect them and can damage the eyes of the baby. So uh, there's all sorts of things that can occur here, but it's an easy treatment. Tetracycline, good old tetracycline. It's been around for years. You know, back in the 70s, everybody got tetracycline for everything to the point that there were so many types of bacteria that became immune to tetracycline. You know, because um, parents would bring their kids in with a, with a sore throat and they get tetracycline without considering the fact that it was a viral disease. And antibiotics don't do a thing for viral diseases. Antibiotics only work in bacterial infections. They don't work in viral diseases. Tetracycline is an antibiotic. And so you go home with a, with a bottle of tetracycline for your kid and take this, take this, take this, and then they would get better and say, oh, they're cured, except that the virus usually gets better anyway on its own in 10 days. So, but now you've created bacteria that are resistant to the tetracycline. So for a long time, tetracycline was, was sort of pushed to the side. And now that chlamydia has reared up, tetracycline, it seems, has actually got something you can work on again. So, so it's a very easy uh, infection to treat. You just have to know uh, your patient has to recognize that they've got something going on. So, so. Numbers keep growing, and you're going to see that they, you know, the areas in the south, particularly the southeast, tend to see the, the highest rates of occurrence uh, in here. So, and where do we rate? Well, this is from 2016. Um, uh, across the southeast, uh, we have, um, you know, we are 
We're number, you know, Texas has a lot of cases of um, yeah, you know, we uh, 127,000 cases in Texas. Um, each year now the last year that we had numbers for um, our rate our rate was um, not bad of course West Virginia uh, those numbers are got to be a little I mean yes I know they don't have as many people as we do but those those numbers have to be really skewed you know so I'll just pick on West Virginia for a second okay here's what it looks like in your patient it can scar the eyes. It can grow inside the mouth. You can see this is all bacterial growth. Hmm? This is that baby's eye, right? Oh yeah, it's a baby's eye. You know, it's it's you know, scarring the the corneas, the coverings of the eye here. Or you can see it growing inside the mouth. Notice that if you remember, um, actually we haven't talked about this. I'll point this out. This is the uvula right here. This is the thing that dangles down in the back of our mouth, back of our throat that we see. And our tonsils are on either side of it. Our tonsils are back here and back here. Here we see all this inflammation going on, all this that yellow stuff is bacterial growth. So uh, it can spread anywhere. So um, now discharges. Note the discharge from the urethra, it's transparent. Uh, the discharge from the vagina is transparent. You know, it might not even be noticed, you know, particularly if there's no pain involved. This is what it looks like in the uh, boviduct. You know, the bacteria up there is a rod-shaped bacteria. It is a gram-positive bacteria. Uh, I can tell that because it stains purple. And um, bacteria in the, in the, when you take micro, you'll learn about gram-positive and gram-negative but it's based on the stain. If they stain purple, they're gram positive. If they stain pink, they're gram negative. So, you know, very simple uh, definition there. What you see in the right though, is all these colonies of, of chlamydia growing in the uterine tube, growing and dying and growing and dying and creating scar tissue that's gonna block the oviduct or block the urethra. So now gonorrhea. Another bacterial infection. Uh, the common name for this is plaque. It's been around for hundreds of years. Um, it um, will cause uh, bacterial growth and scar tissue in the urethra, in the um, uh, oviduct, in the vagina, in the uterus. Uh, you know, it, it uh, in the rectum and anus. It can grow all through in here. Uh, it's again treated very easily with different types of antibiotics. You know, amoxicillin is is like the uh, uh, one of the classic treatments for it. However, there are strains that are going to be that are becoming resistant. Uh, the cases have been dropping, but we still have five hundred thousand cases a year. You know, and this is another one that's it's easily treated. You know, um, males will show painful urination, and a yellow-green discharge. Classic is this yellowish-green, creamy discharge out to the urethra. The female may show that or may not show anything at all. Again, um, she may have a discharge too, if she know, but again, she may not notice it. Um, she may have a lot of pain during her period. Untreated, it will lead to pelvic inflammatory disease also and grow over all these, the, the ovaries and, and oviducts. So um, the difference between chlamydia and gonorrhea, the, the biggest giveaway is the chlamydia discharge is going to be clear, almost impossible to identify it. And the gonorrhea discharge is going to be greenish yellow. And you know, where it works, affects, like in the female, it particularly affects the oviducts up here. And we see a lot of spikes at different times at the occurrences. Uh, anybody want to guess what was taking place between 1941 and 1945? World War II was going on in there. Um, in, this, in the 60s and 70s, um, you know, 
there was a lot of, um, you know, nobody believed that, that uh, gonorrhea was a problem anymore. So there's a lot more experimentation with, with sexual activity. Uh, the 60s and 70s were the, how should I say it, pre-love time frame. You know, it also had, but it had a price that came with it. But then it dropped back down again. You know, at the same time, you know, uh, HIV was was uh, uh, rearing up, and so it was driving the need or the, the, driving the use of, of more condoms during sexual activity, and so that's why you see this this really dramatic drop here, right around the early '80s when HIV was like you know bec becoming a significant concern, and it has sort of stayed at this level ever since. So. This is what the discharge looks like. Now, down at the bottom there, that greenish yellow discharge, that's the giveaway. Yes, you have a patient that it hurts to urinate, it hurts during sex, they have unexplained pain, maybe in the testes, your, your female patient is discharging a yellow, yellowish green discharge. She has a lot of abdom abdominal pain. You know, it's not gonna hurt to check and see if she has a, a bacterial infection. So now it can grow anywhere. Here we see an individual that has scarring of the rectum from anal sex. They've been infected with gonorrhea. It grows in there. And what's happening is that it's narrowing the rectum. It's going to affect the uh, sigmoid colon. That's this, uh, this part of the large intestine here that curves up. Or here's the uh, large intestine goes up over and down, then we move into what's called the sigmoid colon, and that leads to the rectum. But now we've got all this bacterial growth in here, narrowing the open there, making it more difficult for an individual to evacuate their bowels. And of course, you have this infection growing, moving up into the, the, uh, the colon itself. So syphilis. Syphilis is the third bacterial infection. This is the one that can kill your patient. Chlamydia can't kill your patient. Gonorrhea can't kill your patient. Make, make life unpleasant for them, but it won't kill them. Syphilis can. Syphilis is also bacterial. It's not a virus. Um, but it, it's very, very sneaky. It comes in three, three stages. The first stage uh, occurs shortly after exposure. And you get this open lesion or sore either on the labia or inside the vagina or on the head of the penis. And you know, your patient may want well, to put some cream on it and it went away. Well, that's what they do. The chanker shows up, stays there for a week or two, then goes away. And that's the end of stage one. And it's painless. There's no uh, another, there's no overt symptoms here. But that's the first sign of a, of, a, of a syphilitic infection. Second phase causes a rash to occur across the body. Pains in the joints, like if you have an, an over 60 year old patient who has a rash and they have joint pain, it's not like it might not be arthritis. Because remember, that's the, the, the over 60 age group are the ones who are, are most likely to have these. Um, after the rash goes away, then it can go latent. And it can stay that way for the rest of your patient's lives. And they get this really ugly rash across their skin, their face, their hands, palms of their hands, soles of their feet, across their genitalia. And, they can, and then that goes away and they go into a latent phase which may or may not go to the tertiary phase. The tertiary phase starts, develops lesions in the brain, in the heart, in the blood vessels, in the spinal cord, and kills your patient after 20 years. You know, and it's not reversible. Now you can treat it at any of those stages with uh, antibiotics, particularly amoxicillin is ideal for this. Um, but if, it, if it's, let go too far, then it, it can kill your patient, you know. Um, now, 
you see the big spike here during World War II. Oh, we have another comment. Uh, if someone is allergic to the penicillins, then there are other antibi antibiotics that can work. Cipro, which is a very powerful antibiotic, um, can be used to treat syphilis. You know, many people are allergic to uh, the amoxicillins and the, and the penicillins and the augmentins and stuff like that. My wife can't take it. She has to use uh, uh, something else. You know, uh, if it's, a, you know, she'll use um, Cipro if there's nothing else. Uh, but that's sort of like the, the last resort. You know, it's a very powerful antibiotic. We use that for treating anthrax. Uh, she may use, um, uh, what's that? Uh, uh, the one you take for three days in a row and then you're done. Um, what do they call it? They come in a pack. Um, I'll think of it. So, uh, so there are there are other medications. The ideal choice, of course, is going to be the penicillins. But if you can't, if your patient can't take it, then they take something else. So, and if they're allergic to a lot of things, then you know then you're going to have to look at the risk factor as just how allergic are they to a uh, to a penicillin. You know. Uh, sometimes the allergy is just a rash they have to live with. So you have to, you have to weigh the, what is the, the greater good for your patient, a rash or a bacterial infection. Yeah, so. so are there any reliable tests that these will show up on like blood work? Or blood work like shows it up every time. So. Uh, acetromacin, that's what it is. Hmm? Acetromacin, acetromacin. Uh, that's the one that you say every day. Yeah. Um, Oh, it's right in the tip of my tongue. So. Thank you. Thank you. Zithromycin. Uh, that's what you're, yeah. You were giving me the clinical name. I guess. Uh, yeah. No, you're fine. Z packs. Zithromycin. You take two the first day and then one after that for five days and you're done. That works great in my wife. It doesn't do, I'm in that 35% that it doesn't touch. So, um, oh, it'll work if I take two packs in a row. So, what's, what's the point? Because then you're taking the, a regular dose of anything else. So now um, this is what a chanker looks like. There we have in the glands, we have the chanker growing there, but over here, right below the uh, labia, we have a chanker here. So, and it goes away. It doesn't hurt. It, you know, you may, your patient may have said, well, I put some uh, antibiotic cream on it and it went away. Well, of course it did, because that's what it does. Um, but when it goes away, it will usually go right into, eventually, within two months, go into its secondary stage. And again, it's also very treatable with antibiotics. These are all second, these are all chankers and lesions. Now, the chankers there in the penis and, um, you know, around, um, uh, and some of them on the face here, but most of those are going to be the rash. You know, look at the rash here across the torso, here on the hands, on the legs. This is a pretty extreme case of the rash, but this all goes away. You know, if that isn't a red flag to say, hey, you know, I've got a problem here. I need some antibiotics. Um, but now the from here, it can either go away, go latent, and stay latent for forever. Or if it comes back in 20 years, it's going to start attacking the brain, spinal cord, and cardiovascular system at this point. And this is this is where it will kill you. You know, uh, it will eat, it will dissolve away, uh, it will attack, uh, like you can see what it's done to the nasal to the nasal septum, to the jaw. Uh, you know, it's just it, you can't re re over you can't recover from this. So uh, you know, it, um, of course, your patient will um, probably develop uh, some sort of uh, uh, insanity. Along, it'll have some serious psychological issues because their brains will be destroyed. Uh, they'll become irrational. Uh, they, they may develop a dementia uh, before it kills them. It will destroy their heart. Uh, so, and there's, so there's no going back to it once it gets into this latent state, this, this, uh, tertiary stage. Um, you ever, y'all heard of Al Capone, right? You know, the famous gangster 
from the uh, 1920s and 30s. Uh, he died from, you know, um, he, he uh, was, was a responsible for bootlegging and, and gambling and prostitution and personally killed you know, a dozen individuals. Uh, the only thing they could get him on was tax evasion. He went to jail for uh, six years. He was released and he died from syphilis. So, because he sampled his products. Hmm. Yeah, so, um, and you know, from what I read, he was just, he was completely insane before he died. So, uh, and that's what happens here in the, in the, tertiary, the tertiary stage. And yet, they could have easily been treated. Uh, even in the 1920s and 30s, there were drugs that would treat uh, syphilis. You know, um, the, the, uh, mercury had been used very successfully, uh, and there were other drugs that had um, that would kill the disease without killing the patient. So there, there were cures out there. You know, once antibiotics came along, then you know it, it pretty much all went away, at least for a while. So, yeah. Seems like it's always been yeah. Yeah. Now the secret is she just unlocks it on her way out. <laughs> Here you did. Okay. Here we go. Here's one that is. Um, Trichomoniasis. You know, it just uh, the the worst part about trichomoniasis is being able to say it correctly. Um, but this is very curable. This is a protozoan infection, you know, like an amoeba or something that grows into the reproductive tract. Uh, this is very very common in sexually active females. Um, there are a couple of very prominent symptoms. There is a very powerful odor from vaginal discharge. It, it's sort of a yellowish green discharge, not like gonorrhea. Yeah, it's yellowish green, but this has a very powerful, unpleasant odor coming off uh, this discharge. Uh, also, you can see spots on the labia uh, along the vagina. They look like, they call them strawberry spots because they, isn't it doesn't, if you look at this, it doesn't look like a strawberry, you know, like a little marks and like a little uh, sh uh, shape of a strawberry. But it's the odor and strawberry spots. Um, it is easily treated. There are there are numerous and uh, not antibiotics, but um, not antifungals. Um, but it will, that you can get rid of this. It's, it's like a, it's like a, it's like an amoeba or a. Uh, Paramecium. Yeah. Um, is that like the same protozoan infection as like trichinosis from pork? Um, different? It's a different one, but it's, it's you know, again, it's the same type of uh, infection, you know, uh, whereas at least with pork, we can kill the protozoan by cooking it fully, you know. Um, you know, we don't, you know, trich, um, uh, trichinosis is only a health issue if we eat raw pork. You know? Most of us don't eat pork sushi. So, um, but yeah, it, it's, it is a protozoan. So, you know, there are antifungals and antiprotozoan, anti-protista type drugs that will cure this easily. Again, now this is something that when your patient wakes up one morning and has this very unpleasant odor uh, uh, coming from the region of the vagina, that's the giveaway right there. And it's easily treated. So. General warts. This is caused by the human papillomavirus. And again, this is something your patient shouldn't wake up one day and say, hey, where did they come from? The human papillomavirus, the same virus that will cause uh, cervical cancer, you know, HPV, the same virus that it is, um, you have, we had the vaccine, the Gardasil vaccine for. Um, these warts are just like any other warts. Warts are caused by a virus. And if you've ever had a wart, it's just a little bump of tissue that grows. 
and then you can have it removed. You can treat it, you can freeze it off, and that's probably the best way to get rid of it. Um, they look like little cauliflowers around the um, uh, around the the labia, for example. Um, the um, they tend to block the uh, vulva. They grow into the vestibule. It makes it very painful for intercourse. Uh, it's in the way. Um, a lot of itching and scratching in here with these warts. Uh, it is the number two STI. Your chlamydia is number one. Genital warts is number two. Uh, the good news is that while, yes, lots of people have them, uh, most of these viruses that cause the genital warts, the HPV virus that's causing the warts, doesn't cause the cervical cancer. So um, it, you know, it needs to be treated though. These are what the warts look like. Here we see on um, the labia, you can see these clusters of these, these warts here. And over here we see individual clusters um, along here. I, th I think that's, uh, that's just, yeah, that's just growing on the, here, just growing on the leg there. But, you know, it can be, again, you can have them removed. They, 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 they freeze off. You know, anybody that's ever had a skin tag or something removed uh, from a dermatologist, they have these little cans of liquid nitrogen. They just spray it, you know, uh, or, you know, like a mold. You know, if you ever had a mold removed, you know, uh, you, know you just, you don't, you don't even have to cut, have them cut off. You just freeze them off and they, they go away. So, um, so uh, sometimes though, I don't know, come on, there we go. Stop it, stop it. There we go. Now, the question is, how did it get, yes, thank you, yeah. <laughs> how do you get this far? You don't wake up one day and say, well, where did that all come from? You know, that, those are genital warts. You know, and while they grow rapidly, they don't grow overnight rapidly. You know, and they don't go away. And your your you know, your patients, we're all human, and we all like to live in denial and say it'll if we ignore it, it'll go away. If it gets that bad, is there like vascularity to it? Can you remove it at that point? You can. I mean, because you you would have to literally you would have to freeze it if you if you started trying to cut it you would cause some serious pain and discomfort here. But if you freeze it with liquid nitrogen, it'll, it'll like you would do any other ward, it'll go away. So, uh, but yeah, this is, you know, you, well, how, I just don't understand. Now, now, professor, if you freeze it, it goes away from the area, but yeah. the patient is still... Oh, they still have the virus you know, in their body. You know, now, uh, are there antivirals? Uh, would, the, would the Gardasil vaccine help? Probably, uh, you know, uh, but to let it get to this stage is really, you know, to me, it just, I, I don't understand. Oh, I don't understand either. I mean, I, every time I, I show this, I always like, you know, um, I, I don't understand how someone could let it go this far. But then again, consider the, consider the person that had the goiter that was the size of a football under their neck. It didn't go away. Or your lung cancer patients that continue to smoke three packs a day. You, know, you can't explain that. You know, so, okay. Now, herpes. Herpes is also viral. Remember um, that um, warts are viral. Uh, herpes is viral. Now, the, the syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea are all bacterial. There are two types of herpes simplex um, viruses. So herpes simplex one and herpes simplex two. Now, most of us have herpes simplex one in our bodies. That's the one that causes a cold sore. Have you ever had a cold sore? Uh, the virus lives, I'm sorry, the viruses don't live. The virus exists in the nerves, um, uh, in the um, dendrites um, of the nerves lying in the mouth, for example. And when we get stressed, 
the virus starts making copies of itself and manifests. Uh, it causes a sore that occurs usually in the corner of our mouth somewhere. And when we get really stressed, we tend to get cold sores. I'm not gonna lie, I had one in the inner, like in the lining of my nostril. Mm -hmm. That wasn't fun. I'm sure it wasn't. You know, <laughs> but yeah, it, it um, you know, it, it can happen. It can happen pretty much anywhere in the mucous membrane. But they go away. They form a blister, and then they go away in about 10 days. Because it takes our immune system about 10 days to mount a response to, to, the, to a virus. Our antibodies that we produce will get rid of a virus in about 10 days, as long as it doesn't change its, its uh, uh, antigens, change its identifiers. However, um, H, you know, herpes simplex 1, has been showing up in the genital regions more frequently. Uh, herpes simplex one uh, is always spread, you know, we get it from skin to skin contact. Uh, you know, it may not be because you're having mucous membrane to mucous membrane, but you know, you pick up a glass and drink it. This is where those drinking after somebody might get you in trouble. Uh, you're not gonna catch it off of a toilet seat. Um, but uh, you know, it, it's highly contagious. But what we're seeing is a real rise in, in the occurrence of H herpes simplex one in the genital area because of a, a spike in oral sex. We can probably thank Bill Clinton for that one, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, because you know, if you have oral to genital, uh, contact, and one of the uh, participants has a cold sore, then that same virus can now uh, affect the, um, the genitalia, male or female. And so we see, um, you know, uh, these cold sores appearing on the labia or on the penis in here, uh, particularly in middle school age students. Because, you know, for some reason, you know, and I'm, I'm not blaming Bill Clinton or anything like that, but for, for some reason, middle school students seem to think, have this belief, and a lot of them have this belief, that oral sex isn't real sex, and, so, and there's no risk in, involved here. Well, there is a risk with, if 80% or 90% of the population is exposed to the cold sore virus, it, it can spread there. The same thing can happen from HS uh, herpes simplex two. That is the genital um, herpes, and the one that occurs uh, with open sores on the, on the uh, vagina, on the penis, uh, on the rectum. This is the genital herpes that is very painful, uh, and now it's showing up around the mouth. So you're having a, a, an exchange of these two viruses in here. One that's normally uh, an oral virus is now showing up in the genitalia. The genital herpes virus, herpes simplex two, is now showing up around the mouth and in the rectum, well, in the, particularly in the mouth. So um, HS, uh, herpes simplex one is contagious, but not nearly as contagious as uh, herpes simplex two. Here's our typical cold sore, you know, this is what we get. This is what, you know, from a stress. This is actually a student of mine about 10 years ago. Uh, and it, I wasn't the cause of her, her stress. I'll just tell you that. So uh, I believe it was because she was taking microbiology at the time, but it wasn't my fault. Uh, but she offered to let me use a picture of this. And it goes away. And, you know, you can put uh, her percent and some of these other antiviral topical, uh, topical drugs in there. And it'll, you know, it goes away quicker than, you know, than 10 days. And they're uncomfortable. We all know how much, how much they hurt. But now those type of sores, lesions are showing up on the genitalia too. Just like what we see from uh, genital herpes showing up on the, around the mouth. Um, the, um, these, the, the genital herpes, herpes simplex two, uh, herpes goes through a lot of latent periods. 
it will come, it will flourish, it will produce a lesion, and it'll go away. And then something will trigger it again. Something as simple as exposure to bright sunlight can trigger it. Um, intercourse can trigger it. Stress can trigger it. So um, there's, you know, the, the problem, of course, here is this particular type of herpes can be passed on to the baby in utero. Okay. And so this is what the uh, type two looks like. You know, the lesions are much larger uh, and much more painful than just your, your typical cold sore uh, herpes. Because the cold type, uh, herpes simplex one gives you a cold sore, you know, and it hurts and then it goes away. Type two gives you lots of sores and lots of lesions that are very painful. Um, and it's very, very contagious. Okay, and that is everything on reproduction. So let's, um, before I move on, are there any questions on this? On that cheery note. So well, let's move into um, this. I have enough time to go ahead and start pregnancy, start looking at pregnancy. And okay. so, so yeah, after um all those vivid imagery images we've seen. Um, you know, and you thought thinking about your grandma having sex was in a, was enough to burn your eyes out. So, um, but don't tell your grandma I said that. If you know, I can't. Mine's dead. Oh, I'm sorry. So, okay. Pregnancy and development. Now, in females, we always assumed for years that the total number of eggs a female had in her ovaries was already determined at birth. We always said that during uh, in utero, the female baby would have about uh, two or three million eggs laid down uh, in the ovaries and usually have a million at, at birth and by uh, puberty about 400,000, and that's what would be used over the reproductive lifetime of you know, 40 years, from puberty to, to menopause. We'll just pick a round number like 40 years. You know, so, And you would assume that there'd be one egg released every 28 days. And it, so you would, out of those 400,000, you would use you know, 500 eggs over the course of the reproductive lifetime. Now, we're not so certain because it's possible that the oogonia, the stem cells, the counterparts, that, remember spermatogonia? Spermatogonia in the, in the testes are the stem cells that are gonna give rise to the sperm cells. The oogonia may still be functioning uh, along the lining of the ovary and producing new eggs. And this, we, this, is, this, this is really, fairly cutting edge information here that, you know, in, in a few more years, they may be saying, well, new eggs are produced all the time. Because the concern has always been that if you have a 40 year old female and she's pregnant for the first time, she's pregnant with a 40 year old egg. If the egg, you know, if the egg is as old as she is, that egg is old and it may be fragile and may have issues in its DNA. And we don't know how many times a a 40 year old female may have had successful conception, but something was wrong and it never, never implanted uh, for whatever reason. So, but lots of people that are 40 years old are having babies. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if lots is a good number, but we'll just say lots. Um, I know one. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so, um, and, and the concern was that an older egg 
would be more prone to risk on the, on the baby, leading to things like uh, Down syndrome or autism or some sort of congenital defect that, that might occur. And yet those numbers are still really low. So uh, it, um, is, it, uh, is it really the, you know, is, is the age of the egg that critical or are we making new eggs all the time? So, okay. Oh, Genesis and spermatogenesis uh, are a little different. Spermatogenesis gives you a uh, diploid uh, spermatogonia cell that becomes, uh, will ultimately become four immature sperm cells that are haploid. In um, oogenesis, you get one gamete, you get one ovum, an egg, and what we call polar bodies. We still have to go through two stages of meiosis. Uh, remember, meiosis means nuclear reduction. We have to go through two stages of meiosis, just like we do in spermatogenesis, but we only get one viable gamete instead of four. Spermatogenesis gives you four immature sperm or four gametes, each different. Oogenesis gives you one viable gamete, one egg. So, problems that can occur since the male is making lots and lots of sperm cells, because typical ejaculation is about 400 million sperm, the error rate's very low, three to 4%, you know, because mistakes do happen. Sometimes you know, things are gonna, are, are, aren't always gonna line up correctly during meiosis. You're gonna get a mistake. You, know, you may get an extra chromosome fragment. You may miss a chromosome fragment. You may forget one of the sex chromosomes, you know, so the error rate so is very, very low. Oogenesis has an error rate of 20%. So because you're only, you're only gonna get one A that you can use as, a, as an ovum, you know? And so the error rate of when you're rearranging your, your you know, you're, you're doing your my, my, meiotic uh, reduction, nuclear reduction, the odds of getting a mistake to happening is pretty high in here, so. Okay. So what happens here? In the ovaries, it's a 28-day cycle. Ovulation day is always the 14th. Whatever day that ovulation occurs becomes the 14th day. You have two phases here. You have what's known as the follicular phase, where the eggs are going to be exposed to a follicle stimulating hormone, and they're going to be growing and enlarging. And then you have the luteal phase, which occurs after the uh, egg has been ovulated. This is where the corpus luteum grows and produces progesterone up to about day 26 or 27. And then everything starts shutting down then. Um, it is not a true 28-day cycle. Everybody's, every female's cycle is going to be variable. You know, 10% of all women have a 28-day cycle. The rest are going to be 27, 26, 29, 30, whatever. But whatever day ovulation occurs is always the start of the, of, is always day 14. Because from that point, from day 14, even if it was the 17th day of the ovarian cycle, it's day 14, because now it takes seven days to get the egg to the uterus. And in seven more days, it has to implant and or it's going to slide out. So it's that, that, that for some reason is a hard and fast number. The luteal phase is always going to be 14 days. The follicular phase can be whatever it takes. But the whatever day ovulation occurs, it's now 14 days to the end. So what will happen here, and this is where you need to keep in mind that there are two terms here that I can use to get you really confused. Follicles and ova or oocytes. A follicle is the bubble that contains the egg. The egg is called the oocyte. So the follicle surrounds the oocyte. You have two different structures. Follicles are made up of cells 
molecular, properly called follicular cells. Yeah. So just like we had in the thyroid, follicular cells here, but here we have the oocyte, the egg. And we can have primordial follicles and primary follicles and secondary follicles and tertiary follicles. And we can have a primary oocyte and a secondary oocyte. So um, two different terms here. Now what will happen during the follicular phase, we're gonna soak the ovary with follicle stimulating hormone. And it's going to stimulate these follicles to grow. Only a handful of follicles are going to, that are selected are going to grow. And then when um, we get to the middle of the follicular phase, we shut off the FSH. So sure. we're, you know, here we are in day, day one to day 14, which is day one. This is the follicular phase here. FSH levels are high, and then right about the middle, they drop. FSH drops in middle, right about day seven. Now, see, they've been soaking all these follicles for a long time of FSH. And somewhere in the middle of the follicular phase, only one follicle survives that cutoff. Everybody's being soaked with FSH. Um, and only a handful of them are growing. So you, ha you have in your ovary, here's our, here's our ovary here. And you have a cluster of follicles and have been exposed to FSH. These are follicles, if you couldn't tell. Um, and they're growing. They're growing constantly. But then we cut off the FSH on day seven, and only one continues to survive past that. We don't know why that becomes the dominant follicle. And when did this start? This process of selection started a year ago. So the egg that's getting released on the 14th day of the ovarian cycle for a female today was actually selected out a year ago before it, as, as the, becoming the dominant follicle. And we don't know why. We don't know why it was a dominant follicle. So actually, you know, the dominant follicle and a half a dozen of its friends are, are all growing for a year. And then suddenly the dominant follicle is the only one that survives and is the one that's going to get ovulated. So, so can you perceive that it's going to be the dominant follicle? Like if somebody was going to try to have, like, have a child? No, what you would do is uh, you would track uh, ovulation. And so you could then select the egg as, as it's ovulated. Because yeah, you can, uh, if, you're, if you are giving, administering uh, Increase levels of FSH to your to your female to your patient, then you can go in laparoscopically and take a look at the ovaries and say, well, there it's about ready to uh, ovulate. We can harvest the egg. See, and a lot of times, if you uh, give more, uh, you, the the egg is is going to be released from a graphene follicle. Well, what a lot of times uh, increased uh, saturation with FSH may produce a lot of graphene follicles with a lot of eggs being ready to be harvested. So, um, and that's how you would get an egg or eight eggs or however many you would go for. Um, but to determine a year out, you can't figure out which one's going to be the dominant follicle. You can't even see them at that point. You can't see them until um, the, the, um, the graphene follicle is about ready to pop. Then you can see where the egg is inside that. So, Prior to that, then prior to that, we don't know why. You know what makes that particular egg in that particular follicle the dominant follicle? Because each one of these follicles here has an egg has an egg inside of it. Why is this one selected? We have no idea. So, um, 
Is it chance or is it because uh, it's a healthier follicle? We don't know. So we do know that it has started a year a year ago before it is is ready to ovulate. So the egg that's ovulating has was pre-selected 12, 12 months earlier. Okay. Now here's what we see in our hormones. Um, FSH is going to is going to rise, and you'll notice there's a little bit of a, there's a dip there. See how the, the red FSH level drops mm -hmm. right at uh, about day seven? That's where the dominant follicle gets selected. Luteinizing hormone levels have stayed fairly low, but then about day 14, they will spike. It is the release of luteinizing hormone on day 14 that triggers ovulation. And of course, we see FSH levels go up then too, but then they drop off dramatically. So does the luteinizing hormone. Everything, everything drops off. Uh, because we're, what we're going to see here is the rise of progesterone coming in. So, so let's produce some eggs. We've got a few minutes before we call it a day. The process of egg development in the female takes years. It starts in, in utero. We have stem cells in the female ovary developing in utero that are going to, uh, we have, these are the oogonia, just like the spermatogonia. And they are producing what we call primary oocytes. These primary oocytes, that's the, the beginning of the eggs. The primary oocytes are diploid. They are, these primary oocytes are diploid and they have to become haploid. So that means diploid like us, they, like, they have all 46 chromosomes. They want, they need to be haploid and have 23 chromosomes. So now what will happen is um, the process of oogenesis takes, starts in utero, in the fetus, and it will continue uh, to give you thousands and thousands of oogonia, millions of oogonia. In the, in the developing ovaries. Now we still haven't gotten to childbirth yet, but we're making these hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of immature eggs. Now after birth, these, uh, these oogonia are gonna start growing. They're gonna become what are known as primary oocytes. They are diploid and they stay diploid until puberty starts. So here we are, you know, we've got these oogonia, they undergo mitosis. Uh, all those cells, you know, they're divided just like the spermatogonia do. Um, uh, a lot of them are, staying, are, going to be, are going to stay there as oogonia. The other oogonia are going to start growing and become primary oocytes. They, at that point, you have a diploid primary oocyte, which undergoes its first step in meiosis. Meiosis, of course, is nuclear reduction. You know, it, we have to get from 46 chromosomes down to 23. So the primary oocyte will start first meiosis, and it stops right after it starts. It stops in prophase when the stages of meiosis are, you know, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase one, and prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase two. It's a, it's a two stage process with the same steps. So the primary, the, the primary oocyte undergoes, starts meiosis, but stops at prophase one and stays that way until puberty. So all the eggs, all the all the the oogonia that have become primary oocytes all start meiosis and they stop in prophase one and they stay that way till puberty starts. But but and most of them aren't going to make it. The millions and millions that we started with in utero are down to about seven hundred thousand at birth. They degenerate. They degenerated. 
And by puberty, that 700,000 is down to 400,000. Now, but they are all going to be uh, primary oocytes that are stuck in prophase one. And that's where they stay until puberty starts. And that's a good place to stop. So, yeah. And we can pick up with this again on uh, Monday. And uh, I think we'll just get out of here. And...